So hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me uh, today for my session. And uh, to introduce myself, I'm Zhongfu and I lead the gameplay development team in Yahaha Studio in Shanghai. Uh, in this presentation, I will be discussing how we arrived at the decision to use data-oriented design as our primary development approach and the process we followed to build our very own NT component system. As we were developing our UGC platform using data-oriented design, we encountered various challenges that prompted us to continuously refine our approach. I'd like to share some simple techniques we used to enhance our system. Uh, before we get started, let me just give you a quick rundown on what Yahaha is. I'm guessing not many of you have already heard of us yet, so I wanted to take a short moment to introduce ourselves. At Yahaha, you are, uh, we are de dedicated to empowering game creators by offering them an easy-to-use 3D UGC creation tool. We believe that everyone should have the chance to bring their game ideas to life and uh, uh, maybe share, share them with the world, right? Gamers today want more freedom to enlarge their creativity and personalize their own 3D worlds. That's why we built our UGC platform to meet these growing demands from gamers. And since our alpha version had been launched in uh, April of last year, uh, we have already attracted over 100,000 early access creators and generated over 10,000 from games. Here's a let me show you a quick video and give you a better idea, maybe on this. Okay, so let's get, get back to our topic today. So before we start uh, going to plan, plan to uh, building our platform, we need to agree on what's important for our platform and we, w what kind of goals we need to achieve, right? So uh, the first thing is that we aim to offer our creator an easy to use logic editing tool that require minimal to no coding. We believe that simple, Simplicity is crucial for UGC platform as it allows creators to unleash their creativity to the fullest. The second thing is perform about performance. We also want to make sure that most games created on our platform have good performance so players could have a good experience to play, right? We want our platform to be able to handle multiplayer games without any glitches or delays. That's a huge challenge, actually. We are aiming for games that can support over 30 players playing together, even on mobile platform. And we don't want our creators to worry about dealing with network synchronization. It is also important that for UGC gamers to create and share their own scenes and assets freely. While on the other hand, we hope the platform is easy to maintain and keep stable. We have a tight deadline to deliver our, actually our first version of functional, uh, first functional version of our platform while maintaining high quality standards. It's important that we uh, keep, adding, keep adding new features to keep our clients engaged and generate better game contents. In addition, we need to ensure that platform remains stable and that the game scenes created by our users 
of all scale levels are easy to maintain and update without causing any disruption. So next is about the challenges. Uh, to achieve our goals, actually we found the most challenging thing is to simplify logic editing for net code. I think this is common sense that for, uh, I think, uh, for indie developers or different kind of game, game developers, you are, uh, you will feel difficult to create net code for a single game, for a multiplayer game, right? So our aim was to make sure that game runs smoothly without developers struggling with complicate, complicated net code. We researched common methods and frameworks used in game development for network synchronization but we found that they often require complex net codes to keep everything in sync smoothly. There are different ways to synchronize game data over a network, such as uh, you know uh, state-based uh, synchronization or like frame-based synchronization or uh, a hybrid of both to improve game responsiveness. There are various techniques to tackle network latency like uh, you can do client-side prediction or do some server-side reconciliation. However, for a UGC platform, it is even hard to do such choice. You, it's, it is important to, to be able to adapt to different kind of games. Uh, as you just see in the video, we have like soccer game, like MMO games, which makes it even diffi more difficult to apply a suitable network synchronization model. So in to, and, uh, in the other hand, to integrate the systems like Felix to, uh, to animation uh, effects used widely in 3D games as another layer of complexity to the network synchronization. So netcode is hard. I think this is uh, uh, the first thing. And another issue is also about network is that uh, this will, uh, uh, it, it will, uh, increase the uh, number of RP, uh, if you uh, write a, a multiplayer game, it is uh, unavoidable to write many RPC codes which will make your code uh, dirty, I think, right? Okay, let's take a look at that sample. It's, it's a very simple sample. Uh, here to see how we usually create a shooting function in a multiplayer game use the OOP function. We create two classes, one for player and one for bullet here. To make it work, you need to uh, implement an RPC method on the client side to spawn a bullet object and uh, also play an animation of shooting. And on the server callback to handle damage done to the player uh, when, it, when hit by the bullet. Additionally, we need to include a server-side RPC method on the bullet class to destroy the bullet, which will be called by the server trigger callback. This is a common approach used in many projects. I think this is quite a simple, uh, simple code. However, even though this may seem simple, implementing it requires a solid understanding of the server client communication mechanism and which uh, functions should be executed on the server-side and which functions should be executed on the client side. Moreover, in actual development, we need to deal with network transmission flow control and various conditions to handle such as high latency and bandwidth. So we believe this can make UGC quite challenging for developers, especially for beginners to learn those technical skills required. Uh, so this is a graph that we have tried before. So th this is uh, we ca uh, called node graph. Th this has been widely used, uh, also widely, uh, node graph has also been widely used in many game engines, I think, uh, which is highly regarded for its ability to simplify logic editing. And many people believe that node graph is perhaps the best choice for UGC game tools. We have built the version, th this version of Creator tool with Node Graph as well, and we attempt to use Node Graph to address logic editing challenges. And this image just show a part of the shooting logic, which uh, which you can see uh, see from this node. As seen, uh, non gameplay nodes such as equal, non check here, and take up a lot of space, which makes the graph difficult to read. 
Additionally, the use of RPC nodes is, is called RPC super node client to server. Uh, send uh, those RPC nodes will send messages between client and server or even between different objects. Th this will further increase the complexity of those graphs. So I think node graph may work well uh, for simple and straightforward logic. And it does not require too much program skills for, for developer if you uh, just uh, implement for a single player, single player game. However, as the script logic grows, especially when it involves client server communication, the node graph can become too complex and difficult to work with in, even for some experienced programs. Here's another graph uh, that we have actually implemented before. Uh, it, it, there are so many nodes, um, but uh, the function here is just uh, uh, to triggering a movement and animation. Animation here based on the user input. The nodes connect the nodes and the connections in this graph are so intertwined that it can be difficult for to distinguish one from the other. Understanding this logic on this graph can be very hard, I guess. So there's another idea for node graph is to create such, uh, uh, I call it hybrid nodes that can ha handle both client and server logic. Uh, for example, uh, to take a look at he this two nodes here, uh, when, uh, this is also for the shooting logic that uh, just to take for example. We can create two hybrid nodes. Uh, one is called fire nodes, and the other one is the damage nodes. The fire nodes will handle playing the shooting animation and the spawn bullet on the client side, while it will spawn the bullet entity also on the server side for uh, simulation and do performing the collision detection on the server side, right? And the damage node will handle uh, to play the visual and audio effects for player being damaged by, de to, to be damaged on the client side, as well as performing collision detection and uh, the health deduction on the server side and the synchronized update health values to all the clients. The goal of this approach is to make, sure, make the use of client server communication be transparent to uh, gamers to, to the cr uh, creators from those graphs. However, this approach, uh, I think, has its own issues. The use of RPC calls and the hiding of client server logic makes it even more difficult for users to understand. So uh, just like the two nodes here, if you just uh, see the five nodes and damage node, you don't know what underneath have been executed. It also requires uh, specialized de developers to create and uh, extend those hybrid nodes. And different game, games may require different types of nodes as well, resulting in even more complex, uh, complex complexity. Moreover, uh, the development of more hybrid nodes will increase the development cost. That's, uh, I think, also need to be considered, considered. And the network synchronization code will be scattered throughout each scattered nodes. Take, a, take, a, take as an example here for that if we need to improve or rewrite some code logic in these nodes to uh, like handle some latencies or fix some bugs, it may require us to do, do some, uh, do, do rewrite, rewritten of the code, code in each of those hybrid nodes. Therefore, we have not uh, make too many attempts in this direction. So let's talk about the next um, challenge is about the performance. Uh, we all know that the 3D games have high hardware requirements um, and even for uh, we want to build a platform that can support mobile, mobile phones. So this is because uh, for 3D games, they have many performance consuming modules such as 3D scene rendering, uh, physics simulation, network synchronization, visual effects, and, so, and so, so many others. It wouldn't be ideal for our UGC tools if we left those systems to be handled by our developers. 
But if we can handle these performance sensitive systems at our uh, framework or I, uh, what we say uh, under our platform, it can guarantee that the performance will be above a certain baseline to some extent. In addition, ensuring uh, maximum compat compatibility with older version, uh, older version of the platform during rapid feature development can also be challenging. In game development, we often see games can choose to rebuild from scratch when they want to achieve better performance or issues. However, for UGC platform, it is essential to make the right technology choice from the outside. Uh, I think to avoid the need to uh, such extensive rebuilds. So uh, uh, I think this is uh, a fortunate that we exploring when we exploring those new f solutions, we came across the ECS framework. Uh, which uh, follow the data oriented design and the case study of uh, actually Overwatch presented at GDC, I think this is 2017, also provided us with uh, valuable insights. Uh, ECS, which stands for the entity component system, immediately caught our attention due to its network friendly issue nature. I think uh, many of uh, you, if you are uh, familiar with network in Gaming, you will be uh, know, uh, know about this. While the network friendly aspect was initially uh, what draw us to data uh, to this uh, ECS framework, which based on data oriented design, we soon realized that there are other benefits to this approach as well, which will benefit our UGC platform that I will be I will uh, show you later. Another important aspect we considered was performance. For ECS, it's by, uh, by default performance oriented. As many of you may already know, it offers many benefits like uh, uh, it has been cache friendly, it can reduce some data de dependency redundancy, and uh, it supports parallel computing by default as well. Okay, so uh, we just started our project and we started this try with the ECS programming. We did a lot of research on how can we implement an ECS uh, framework uh, on our own. We uh, do a lot of code read on like unit dots and uh, unit dots architecture and design give us uh, really uh, actually give us a lot of good great ideas that enabled us to quickly develop our own entity component system. Different ECS framework may have their uh, unique ways of functioning and our system is dif no difference. Let's examine the class diagram of our uh, ECS framework. If you look at this chart, you will see that we added a YAR prefix to many of the classes. This is because that we are, since we are using Unity Engine and we need to differentiate our classes, class, classes names if you remove prefix, those class should be mapped to map very closely to what you may already know about ECS concepts. At the core of our system is the YAR word, uh, which will uh, manage all the entities, the systems, and uh, also uh, the entity assessor, uh, which I will talk later, and uh, also it will uh, map to YAR chunk, which holds all our data. Our, uh, for the systems, it can be categorized into uh, three groups, actually in current design, it's still, in, uh, this is actually a snapshot of the current uh, version of our system. So uh, the system can be categorized into three groups. So the first one is uh, the preview system group, and the second is simulation system group. The third is the view system group. For simulation system group, it is uh, where uh, the core gameplay logic exists and uh, executed, and it can be it can be run in a separate thread. Actually, on the other hand, the preview system is uh, executed on the main thread uh, to handle logic operations that require processing in Unity main thread, such as user input uh, or the UI pro UI uh, UI logics. Lastly, the 
View system is responsible for applying data to the representation layer. Uh, take an example, it writes the modification made to transform to, to the entity transforms in the simulation si in, in a system which is in the si simulation system group back to the unit transform. It is through this system group that we can, uh, we are able to ultimately feed the, the results that's calculated by the simulation system back into rendering. Yeah, Chang is where we store the chunk data. There's, uh, it's quite similar to other ECS frameworks, including that the archi uh, an archetype corresponding to the current chunk and provide a set of functions to retrieve data from chunk. So let's talk about uh, the yeah, manage assessor. It is actually an outstanding feature that our system, in, in, in current system, uh, this, this is not by nature what e ECS framework has, but we uh, have it to manage, to, uh, manage the mapping between Unity game objects and our entities. This mapping enables API and the user scripts to assess data free, uh, efficiently. Uh, this class is really, related to the, uh, we call the hybrid component that I will be discussed in the, maybe next, uh, later in some slides. Okay, so this diagram uh, shows how we store data in YAR chunk. Uh, first, we define the chunk's capacity, which determines how many entities it can hold. In this example, the chunk can store up to four entities. Uh, then we allocate memory in the chunk based on current archetype. If the number of entities doesn't fill up the chunk, we reserve memory for future entities. If the number of entities exists, it exceeds the capacity, then the chunk will expand to store more entities. This structure required us to manage data use uh, and manage memory. Actually, our code is written in C-sharp, so when we try to assess a managed memory, we need to use pointers in C-sharp, actually. Each chunk is stored in a continuous block of memory to improve data, data access speed and reduce memory fragmentation. Okay, so next look at our network model that we built upon the ECS framework we just talked about. When you see this picture, you may uh, sure, I think you can remind of the Overwatch GDC talk in 2017. Uh, yes, uh, so our network model draws inspiration from many of the practice used in Overwatch, and we have found it helps address some of the challenges we faced with our UGC platform. So in this model, uh, in, in this network synchronization model, the client mainly does a prediction for client objects, uh, especially for the players. So the user input, user's input can respond to the gameplay of games as soon as possible. Let's in, investigate the, uh, the example here. Uh, so let me use this. So here at, t, uh, at tick 11, uh, the client's input is sent, is sent to the server, is sent through, uh, at tick 11, the, uh, the, this is for client input, will be sent to, uh, it, it will be wrapped in a command sent to server. And at t uh, server tick uh, 10, or maybe uh, sooner or later, uh, the server receives client's packet and record command for the simulation, then on uh, server tick uh, 11, which is uh, similar to the uh, tick, tick which the client sends the command. Server uses client's tick 11's commands to simulate and sends the simulation results to the client. So at client tick uh, 16, or maybe sooner or later, a client receives snapshot from server and compares snapshot at, uh, at tick 11. So uh, if the, if the uh, results of the similar, uh, server simulation is, uh, when, when after veri uh, verification, if the server simulation is the same to what has been uh, calculated on the client, then, uh, it, then it's fine, the clients just uh, keep, uh, uh, do the prediction and uh, the, all the system can be good. Otherwise, it, 
applies uh, the snapshot results from server to the 11th to, uh, applies the snapshot received from server in the six, uh, tick 16 here uh, and uh, applies it to the 11th tick and replace all the calculations from uh, from 11 to current 16. So as for now clients objects, the client's input process is usually omitted. So there is no user input for a, a non-client object, right? And the simulation ticks are performed directly on the server. And the running results are given to the clients, which performs interpolation or uh, uh, smoothing processing for those objects. There are other techniques used in this network model, which I think I don't need to go to details. However, I want to emphasize on the benefit it gives to our UGC platform. Uh, in this network synchronization model, the server must uh, handle a lot of simulations which can increase our server cost to some extent. However, the benefits are very clear. We can put most of the logic on the server to calculate. And the server calculation can be better ensure consistency across multiple clients. It's also more convenient for server authentication we discovered another attractive uh, benefit is that with this model as well, uh, which was uh, that the ability to simplify logic editing by enabling user logic to be executed only on the server. Recording, uh, recall that those RPC functions that even uh, both in code or in node graphs, uh, they're annoying, right? So it seems that we, we can remove them almost entirely with the, this kind of network synchronization model. Okay, so let's take a closer look at how a very simple shooting works in current uh, script. This script runs transparently on server uh, without any intervention required from the game creators. So there's no uh, Player, of, player class or bullet class right now, there's just a, a simple shooting script. So on the server, we can listen to the input from clients and execute the spawn bullet method. The, this creates an entity and a corresponding component data for the bullet. The user can continue to call uh, the physics, physics API here at policy force, uh, which is currently some APIs in Yaha Studio and uh, then you can uh, then you uh, then you can continue to call uh, register a callback here uh, to apply damage and destroy bullet upon the collision with bullet. After executing this method, the results the, the result will sim uh, the resulting simulated data, uh, which generated from server, is sent to the client uh, through the network snapshot the client doesn't need to write any additional script and uh, can just simulate all the changes. Uh, actually, it just does the interpolation or some smoothing process I, that I just mentioned, make the experience very similar to writing uh, the game script for a single player game. Okay, so uh, above all, this is our uh, early design for our system architecture. The main component uh, for us is the entity component system that's in the, in the middle. Uh, it contains the components and systems. Uh, the upper here is the uh, component data, which is very similar to the ECS concept. And uh, the bottom here is the systems. Uh, so here is the, some real system that I catch from our code. Uh, on the on the bottom here is uh, below the this ECS uh, core level is the no function levels. So there's render asset management, uh, physics network, and uh, some more systems, which is the no level function that is, uh, the ECS framework will rely on. And uh, above the uh, ECS layer, there's a hybrid component layer sits on top of this, which is crucial part to our design as well. 
And the hybrid component layer will open our APIs, which uh, you maybe see it from uh, our Lua script or uh, some uh, hybrid components. So, uh, just to be mentioned earlier, I need to uh, maybe break down some details about the hybrid component. So at the beginning of our design, the hybrid component was considered one of the most important module. Well, its main duty is to map a unity game object to our entity, as well as some of its components that are still in use to and convert them to the component data in our ECS system. Uh, that's just to take uh, transform, for example, we need to, we need a hybrid component to convert uh, transform data from a Unity game object to our ECS systems. Another goal for the uh, hybrid component is to provide an API through, through it and can modify the component data of one or more entity. If you are familiar with uh, domain-driven design, you could say that a hybrid component can be considered, considered as a gameplay domain, which can be physics domain, character domain, effect domain, and more. If you can expose our gameplay logic through different domains, then the component data can be more understandable. Because you know that for in an ECS system, there are many data which uh, we think cannot be uh, uh, directly uh, exposed to our developers because they are hard to read, they are just for some in in internal processing. So uh, through this hybrid component, we can uh, hide those uh, internal processing data. Also, this is about API interface. We need to develop, okay. So that's all uh, I talk about, already talk about. Uh, so here is a code actually. The, uh, the purpose of all programs and all parts of those programs is to transform data from one from another. Uh, so this code has been, I think has a long story which has already been quoted many times, uh, I think, and is essential in programming and even in architecture design. The ECS system itself adheres to the principle of data-oriented design and we used to implement our main part in our system. For the entire platform, we also aim to achieve a data-oriented design, not just for um, developed gameplay systems, but also for game components exposed to users. So, uh, so now the question is how can we package our data and provide uh, to our developers? And let me just give you a simple example here. So that's just to take a look at the uh, quite a recent feature that launched at Yahaha platform, the vehicle component as an example. Uh, vehicles are a very common feature in gaming and uh, can provide different gameplay experience to, uh, to players. Our platform provides users with a simplified vehicle model and uh, prompts them to input data for the, bo for the vehicle body and uh, wheels in their respective fields. The wheel component data includes values for uh, radius, uh, which you can see in the graph here, uh, maximum spring force, maximum spring length, damper, sideway friction, and forward friction. The body component data include acceleration, spring acceleration, and brake acceleration, and uh, several other uh, fields here. Uh, these values corresponding to the uh, fu fundamental characteristics and uh, properties of a vehicle and we believe that for those creators who have some knowledge about vehicles, this can be uh, intuitive. So how do we make it work? Uh, we use two systems to implement this functionality. Uh, one is the vehicle system which controls the vehicle input, provide power to engine, uh, and the vehicle wheel system, which controls the wheel ground friction, friction, suspension, wheel rotation, and more. If you take a look at our code, uh, so the right part here is, uh, is our code, uh, which is a component data to uh, represent the, uh, the vehicle body. Vehicle body. Uh, you, uh, if you take a look at it and uh, take a look at the component that we exposed, 
you will notice that the data we expose to users is almost identical to those fields in the component data we define. So how did, does this benefit us? When we release, uh, so when we release an API or a component for UGC developers, for, uh, you, uh, users will start using it and applying it to large numbers of games. For example, uh, with this vehicle system, if we need to update, update it or fix some bugs uh, in the future, we want users to be able to experience the improved version without having to uh, changing any of their existing scene or code. In the traditional OP approach, this may require uh, updating your functions, changing states, uh, and possibly even do changes in some inheritance or abstraction things. This can be a headache for UGC products. However, by adopting this, uh, di uh, this data-oriented design approach, the user's data input is just one thing, uh, is just the only thing that matters to us, making it easier to correct, to do any correct on those bugs issues or just to improve. So let's look at some cars that um, created by, those, uh, by this uh, vehicles, vehicle components. With the compo uh, configuration of these game components, we can create a decent car, which is not surprising. Uh, however, with the same configuration approach, you can also create other kinds of vehicles. You can create a cart and also a vehicle without rear wheel, which could be, which still could be a, drive. I guess it will be funny to put it in some things that you can, uh, you create. And even a vehicle here looks like a spaceship. This piece of work was something we never s thought about when we design and develop our vehicle system actually. And it came entirely from the, creati uh, the creativity of our creators. I found this actually from our Discord. With this kind of flexibility, our users can let their Im imagination run wild, actually. I think they can create anything that they can dream up with the current de uh, design. So let me show you a uh, snapshot here. Uh, so this is a snapshot of our server monitoring dashboard that displays the duration of each system's operation during a specific time period. We have more than 400 systems uh, currently in operation with most of them functioning on both client and server side. Although the screenshot does not capture all of the implemented systems, it provides insight into which ones are consuming the most runtime here. Furthermore, our uh, current infrastructure enabled uh, real-time performance monitoring for each system running our cloud servers which is extremely helpful. In addition to display systems run, uh, uh, system runtime here, our monitoring system also records data such as data sets frequency and efficiency, network snapshots transmit, transmitted by, uh, it, and it could be broke down to event, uh, individual component data. So as our platform grows, users has increasingly requested the ability to create larger and more complex worlds. And, and I think that uh, will be faced by most of the game engine or uh, UGC, uh, UGC tools. This means uh, you need to support more objects, more logics, and more demands for performance optimization. In our development process, we found that by following uh, the design made uh, by following ECS made performance optimization relatively easy and uh, even enjoyable. This had been allowed us to tackle some tasks and uh, that previously seemed complicated or difficult. So I will share you today a few optimizations that we have made during the development process, which will be, uh, some of those may be uh, also a bit funny. You will find in the Okay, so the first thing about is optimizing the dynamic buffer manipulation. So dynamic buffer is, uh, uh, is something like, uh, it's a really like uh, component data which is used in ECS design. 
So when you build a game, the scale of data is, uh, is mostly controllable. So for example here, uh, when you write a game, you can control the capacity of your backpack. But for you, a UGC platform, this comes to be uh, very hard. More control will need to restrictions to creators, which is unwanted uh, by a UGC platform. For example, as for the configura uh, configuration in, the uh, in this uh, screenshot, the maximum capacity of the backpack can be set to a very large value, and the corresponding component data of the items uh, entities will become even larger as the game play components become complex. So at runtime, the same logic on backpack will become increasingly heavy as data grows. So when building the, uh, the, the system, uh, we want to uh, do some, when we want to do some optimization in the dynamic buffer manipulation, so the common way is to uh, maybe do some uh, incremental, uh, incremental sync. It's common to sync the uh, incremental interpolation data. However, uh, when the size of the data grows, you need to loop all the buffer elements. Let me show uh, a simple call here. And so, so uh, here is a code piece that uh, before our improvement, you, you can see here that uh, this is a piece of code that keep uh, updating our backpack back items through a loop. Uh, so this, uh, so this the, this block show how we uh, do the uh, do the loop and the update backpacks before. But let's take a look at the second part. Uh, so, if you take a closer look at this, this part, at, uh, it looks like it's almost identical to the first part block of code. But upon closer in inspection, you will notice that we made. Uh, uh, simple change by using the keyword ref here uh, instead of not using it. You can see here and here. So in C sharp, uh, ref usually means that the variable is mutable through the coding function. So we changed to use uh, the, uh, the method named get ref range to enable any mu mutation on a dynamic buffer uh, component. When we use the get ref range method to loop through a dynamic buffer element, we track the assessed data that needs to be changed and the recorded behavior of the operation. Those operations include uh, set, insert, remove. This allows us to directly pass incremental updates during data synchronization. The get ref range method returns, uh, actually uh, talk about its implementation, it returns uh, a ref enumerator that records the operations on dynamic buffer when 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 we called and prepares data for the next synchronization by performing a data uh, delta uh, serialization. So with this improvement, we will uh, largely save the uh, actually CPUs to uh, do the. Uh, Data comparing before we uh, f before we do for the network synchronization. The next improvement I want to show you is about how to restart a game on the fly. Typically, restart a game means reloading the scenes, which often results in a loading screen like the one below, and uh, the players need to wait for a long time. I don't think anyone enjoys uh, waiting for a game to load or transition between scenes. So just to let you know that why we have such feature, we have a, uh, this is a snapshot from our studio. We have a pa uh, packed version types of uh, single player games for our developers, freeing them from the burden of developing uh, 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 game flow for round-based round games. So we have many round-based games on our platform right now. So for this type of games, after uh, completing a round, if players want to continue playing, they can choose to restart the game. In previous version, restarting the game meant 
unload the scene and reloading it. This is also common for uh, many games, I think, which could take several seconds or even up to dozens of seconds, depends on the size of the scene, and uh, and, and it also depends on the network condition. Now, however, uh, we have made it possible for the game to immediately switch back to the beginning of the scene uh, that I will show you later. Our developer accomplished this using our uh, single API, which is called uh, yagame.resetgame, which takes advantage of platform's data-oriented feature. To put it simply, we just need to roll back all the snapshot except for the player data to the beginning frame, and we can achieve this. So, uh, when we, uh, so we just need to uh, record the, the first tick of the data when, uh, to achieve this, okay. Yeah, so this is uh, to give of the two games that on our platform. So now when they uh, click a restart, uh, the player just come back to the start point and then can just restart the game. So uh, many games have started to use the, using this new API, resulting, uh, uh, I think, a, com a significant improvement in game restart speed. Uh, once after we added uh, the reset game function, one of my colleagues actually uh, had this wide idea after playing uh, games like uh, Braid uh, or Quantum Break, which players can manipulate time by rewinding and pausing pausing the time. So if we could reset the game to a specific tick or a series of tick reversely, what would happen? So is it possible to implement a, a time manipulating feature with our ECS system? So just for fun, we dis decided to add some dirty code. It's just two classes which we just uh, uh, developed, uh, written uh, be uh, before go to GDC and uh, to test, test out his idea. So this is a short video. Uh, let me just explain what will happen. In, in the beginning of this scene, you can see, a, you will see a car racing towards a row of vertical pillars preparing to crash into them. We recorded the, actually, uh, when we implement this, we recorded the snapshot of the scene, uh, about uh, 500 ticks, which is about 10 seconds in our current system which we then use uh, those ticks of data to rewind. We were curious to see what will happen. Okay, so let's just go to. So first the car crash. And uh, here, the two, uh, the two keywords here, we just, um, print on the screen is that, that uh, the first line is the current tick and the second line is the apply tick. So after a while, when it tries to apply the tick that we just recorded, you will see the car, the, the, the whole scene will just rewind back. But this, okay, so you can see the, Okay, so you, uh, what, what you should see is that uh, the fir uh, you, you first uh, go in the direct, uh, uh, directly to push all the pillars, but, and then uh, after some time, it will just rewind back. It seems like time will floating back, but uh, it's about the video issue, you can see it. Okay. So that, uh, let me tell you uh, how we do this. Uh, so implementing such a system with current uh, framework of Yahaha is quite simple. It's quite like that we uh, do when for, uh, do correction for applying network snapshot in the network sync that we uh, talked in that uh, flow for network synchronization. We, cry, we create a dynamic buffer to store and chunk data for each tick that we needed to be recorded. 
And then we use a snapshot record system to record the information when we need to rewind the time back to a specific tick, we just need to apply the recorded snapshot for that tick. So it's basically just to record and apply. So this is a game that, let me just explain. So this is a game that's uh, created by our creator on production. It's, it's quite funny. The, uh, the game is about car rolling uh, down in a, a steep, uh, down a steep slope and the players has a dodge, had, has to dodge it by moving left to right to climb the mountain uh, to, the, to the top to win. So uh, if you have the power to pause and rewind time, it become quite easy, but other than that, it would, it's a difficult game actually. Yeah, so you can see that if we apply tick for uh, apply tick for, uh, from a specific tick that we just recorded, you will see that the time pausing. And also, you can see I see. I don't think it can go in well, but you can, uh, if you're interested in this video, we can uh, show you the, uh, after this session. Uh, so I will quick go through uh, uh, some, uh, the two other improvements. So one is about the AOI. Uh, so what we do for AOI is that we add a component data here, which name the YAR tile to the object and divide them, divide them based on the X axis and the Z axis position. By using player position information, we can determine which data the player should be interested in. It is because, that, uh, our, uh, because our server runs the entire simulation logic, it can calculate and send each client the data they are interested in. This means that the client only needs to receive and si simulate a portion of the world that they are care about, which can significantly reduce network bandwidth and click client resources. Of course, there are maybe some objects that are not limited to the location information, so we need to mark them as global. So the last uh, improvement is about T-grid control. So T-grid control is very common technique. Uh, developers often set uh, lower tick rate, tick rate for systems that have uh, high performance cost but uh, lower real time requirements. In order to re reduce the system cost, so uh, this example is about uh, interactive collect system which is uh, used to, uh, to, de uh, to detect uh, there's uh, some interactives like uh, you pick up a drop item, you uh, close to a chair and you and, uh, interactive to sit on it or start a speech when you close a microphone. However, some detections that not, th those kind of detection does not need to be occur in high frequency most of the time. So uh, how can we set the uh, frame rate of, uh, of this uh, to, to uh, lower down the tick rate? So in our current system, it's quite easy. No. Okay, so here you can see that we just set the execution frequency to once every X tick interval and the set interval to be 10. And uh, to, to make this possible, I think it's due to our uh, design approach. If we were imaging use the traditional OOP method, we might need to include uh, uh, interaction detection within the player's update function, which could make it difficult to manage the logic of other aspects of the player. For example, in the case of shooting, we could uh, also need to execute the scripts on the player object. However, with uh, DOD's uh, decoupling approach, we can easily control the frame rate, frame rate of each system. So for those improvements we have made, we need to find if we have uh, achieved our goals actually. 
So we may not have fully achieved all of our goals, but over a year, uh, we actually started our developing of this framework, started from uh, one year and uh, above one year ago, it's, uh, no more than one year and a half. Uh, we feel that we are uh, still on the right track. With the shooting example, we are able to simplify code complexity to some extent, and our developers didn't have to write a lot of RPC codes now. In most cases, scripting is all that is required, just like writing a single player game. Of course, there are still other, some areas we have not fully implemented yet, such as UI logic, we still need to write client code, but that's uh, not the main part. And we ho have also improved the overall performance of platform by optimizing the data process algorithm. This, be this uh, is because that we have encaps encapsulated the relative complex and uh, some uncontrollable part of the game system by using the ECS approach. Like the, for now, our uh, gamers do not need to take much look at the network transmi transmission and uh, also they do not need to care about physics. They can use some physics APIs we just uh, um, provided but they do not need to take care about the performance actually. So multiplayer game experience has also been benefit from this ECS approach as well as the uh, net codes that we written uh, on, uh, b based on the ECS framework. So uh, the DOD implementation allows the, also allows the assets and the complex game objects to be shared naturally. Uh, the car that I just demonstrated is just one uh, simple example I think so regarding the last point here, uh, I just want to say that we have released our products at a very rapid pace since the alpha launch with numerous updates and new features added. So it looks to be okay. So last I want to say that data also create more possibilities for us. One obvious use is for data analysis. We have integrated the system's running time, data quality, trans transmission quality, and even number of modifications per frame into our monitoring tool, which I just, uh, uh, in, in some upper slides, I just show you one snapshot. During the development, we can save snapshot data to any tick to observe how logical modifications affect data for debugging purpose. And it could also be used with determining which could be possibly create more business values. So, and due to the separation of data and logic in our entity component system, we can continually update our user interface of our studio tool according to our user's needs. Currently, most of the game components we exposed are um, input fields, which can be a bit tedious. Uh, but we are considering whether we can create more visually intuitive editors. This can improve the effects without affecting logic. So this is the final. I just want to take a moment to give a shout out to my uh, amazing workmates who have worked very hard on this project. Some of team members is just to sit on, uh, sit here. I also want to express my gratitude to everyone in Aha Studio for their support for our project and uh, helping us along the way. Uh, and last but not least, uh, a huge thank you uh, to all of the developers who have already joined our community and uh, provided us with invaluable feedback. Okay, before end, it's a uh, S here. I just want to mention that we have a uh, great creator incentive program currently available. Anyone interest, interested in the creating games uh, on Yaha Studio can join us either by sending us an email or contact our, our WhatsApp account. Okay, and uh, also welcome to our booth, which is next to Meta. Okay, that's all, thank you.